So, as we were discussing earlier, the importance of, well, knowing the differences between the function of the Dhamma and psychotherapy, mental health, catering to one's own emotional and psychological uh, social needs. The thing which compelled me to uh, want to have us discuss this more in detail so that it could be put out there into the world and, and hopefully be useful is because of uh, what I have been noticing in my own uh, work with individuals and specifically with students of meditation. And what I mean by that is oftentimes individuals have come with some issues, mental health issues and, and emotional issues, uh, not just to me, but uh, within you know religious circles. I've read about them, I've seen them, I've heard about them, I've heard from other teachers, etc. And most importantly, I've come across students of uh, who were one, uh, you know, the students of one or other teacher or within a certain tradition and they didn't like it this and that and there's a lot of blame this and that tossed um, and then you get to speak with the individual and you get to see the kind of relationships they have held or are in at that moment and then obviously the behavioral factors in their interactions with you and a lot can be uh, seen and observed, and uh, I myself am both a Buddhist monk as well as, uh, before then, a um, clinical uh, psychotherapist trained in mental health, uh, where I've seen thousands of cases, worked with individuals and families and couples and children and all the way up to elderly uh, patients. So that gives you a very good understanding because you're working in a clinical setting. And now when you come to, uh, let's say, in, 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 to the, uh, in the capacity of working as a religious or a spiritual teacher, some people have you know, different positions on between these two words, so I don't care about... You know, for me, it's, it's, they say the same thing in a sense, religion and spirituality. So I'm not going to delve into that here. But... Essentially, I would be, or I am oftentimes seeing uh, individuals who come with the purest and good intention of, of learning a meditation technique so that they can improve their, the quality of their life and reduce suffering. Perfect, beautiful, that's why we're here. That's why the Buddha taught the Dhamma. However, the, um, what they have come and what they have brought to the table, as it were, is uh, too much um, or, or the techniques to be provided to them by this teacher, in this case, let's say myself, to them would be insufficient. What I mean by that, it's not like the Dhamma is, is not uh, equipped. It doesn't have the tools of, of healing. It doesn't have the techniques or the interventions. I think it has all the interventions you could expect. In fact, most of Western psychotherapy and psychology, they're still trying to catch up. And Lord Buddha taught it 2,600 years ago. And let's not forget, he was the very first in documented history who identified two kinds of diseases. One he called it physical disease, and the other one called it mental disease. Mental illness. So this is not putting that into, uh, into question. However, what I do want to speak on more is, is uh, the, uh, the stigma that today is found within the individual. Within the individual. Suffering from that, uh, you know, from, uh, from that symptom, or usually symptoms, plural, and, and, and the way they stigmatize themselves is they deny themselves the truth. 
which is, I need serious help. I need to speak to someone. And no, no amount of me sitting in meditation or going off on re uh, to retreats is really going to address the problem. Because I might go to a daily, even if I'm lucky enough to go to a daily interview with a uh, bona fide teacher, serious meditation practitioner type of a teacher, who knows the suttas, who knows the teachings of Lord Buddha, still, I would have so much more on my plate to deal with than what the Dhamma would be providing me. Because first of all, I have, the, the person uh, in question would be denying themselves the right tools, the right uh, modes of assistance. The teacher there, the Buddhist monk, is not working in the capacity of a therapist. Let's get that straight. So it is no, um, uh, it's, it's not a, a too strange of a, of a, or a abnormal situation, shall we say, for, uh, for a student to require to be seen by a therapist in addition to their meditation practice. So most people uh, who um, have these issues and majority of them uh, uh, want to avoid going to see a therapist. This is ironic because for ages, for, for at least a few thousand years, humanity has suffered uh, from stigmatization or being stigmatized uh, if it did not fall in line with their behavior, their methods, or whatever it was, it was inexplicable for the ruling part of society. What I mean by that is the church, the religious institution. I'm saying it's church, but it doesn't have to be the church or Christian church. It could be the Jew, uh, Judaism, it could be Islam, it could be uh, Jainism, it could be uh, Hinduism, uh, even Buddhism. So... Um, any religious um, hierarchy or the power source, the power house within a society that would dictate what a person needs, basically, essentially. And if the person, let's say, let's take the example of a person going to confession in church, and if the person is doing their prayers, doing their donations, doing uh, whatever the priest tells them to, and they're still suffering, they're still struggling, they're having depression, they're having this, anxiety, this and that. So the church, or the religious, again, it doesn't have to be a particular uh, religious tradition, uh, it would dictate this to be something unlawful. What I mean by unlawful, ungodly, meaning non-divine, meaning something that is without, uh, uh, on the outskirts of what the church has dominion over, meaning the devil land, meaning something that is uh, not holy, something that's very bad. So, as, as human beings, we usually normally look at the pages of history and say, ah, oh, the church did so many bad things, da, 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 or, or, or blind faith, this and that. But <laughs> we always seem to neglect to consider that that, you know, through osmosis, just osmosis, it passes into our very way of thinking. Today, the church doesn't play that big of a part in many of our lives, in, 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 in let's say, modern society. Many people don't find themselves to be religious or spiritual at all. Yet, those same tendencies have been carried over into the lives and especially the thinking of the person. That's what I mean by the church used to be the, the, the one that stigmatized the person's emotional, uh, disharmonious and chaotic, you know, uh, internal uh, situations uh, we, where they don't have any well-being. 
or psychological issues and problems disorders, and they would call them crazy, they would call them this, and they would be calling them like, you know, um, a, a spirit has, has invaded them, and, 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 you know, they need to be exercised, etc., all these things. And now, even though the church doesn't have that big of a voice, nevertheless, we have been doing that work ourselves to each other in society, but especially to ourselves. So I want to then bring that back to what I was trying to say in the beginning, which is the person comes over to me or to any religious teacher, uh, spiritual guide, and then and, and, and a meditation teacher specifically, and they're expecting the teaching to be given to them to heal them because they are denying themselves the fact that they have a major problem to deal with. So this is where a lot of people can go into places where they do, let's say, retreats, mindfulness retreats and 10-day and, and retreats or this. Meanwhile, the garbage is not being taken out. The trash is being left inside the house. And more and more trash is accumulating, is accruing inside the house. Meanwhile, you can take, bring in as much as, as many bottles of Febreze, as many incense sticks, and you can burn them. But guess what? It still stinks. No amount of mantra practice, no amount of breath meditation is going to solve the issues that you still are perpetuating underneath it all. So it is no wonder that some teachers come across students who, although they uh, practice diligently at one point or another, and then they say, ah, I got the trick, I know the trick, and I never need to address the other issues, which they probably might have been avoiding for over 20, 30 years or more. Why? Because they found the magic recipe. Going to psychotherapy sessions, if you find yourself a good psychotherapist, stick with them until your issues are addressed. Because despite the work that you need to be doing, remember, it's not the psychotherapist who needs to be doing your work for you. Just like the meditation teacher is not going to do the work for you. You will have to do because this is your journey, not theirs. And also the rewards are yours, not theirs. They can join in the celebration, of course, especially in the case of your meditation teacher. But many people avoid facing their inner issues. <laughs> I didn't want to say their inner demons, etc., because that would just be ironic or, you know, <laughs> unnecessary. But people are avoiding that. They want the shortcut. So you have, of course, you, you know, if there's a demand for it, guess what? There are people who are going to supply you with that. Right? If there's a need, there's a demand. And people are going to come out of the woodwork, through the cracks in the wall, to say, hey, I got the cure for you. I, I have it. Here's the mantra. Here's, uh, you know, you need to pay me $10,000 for this mantra. You need to do this for me. You need to do that for me for this many years. You need to donate this to me. Guess what? For many, many, many people, it is far easier to write that big, 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 multiple zeroed check to this one person or this one institution than to sit in a therapy session and honestly work on themselves with the help of a qualified mental health practitioner, empathetic individual sitting in the room with them. So, you take that and you bring it into the modern world, 21st century, and especially with so much availability of, in the case of Buddhism, suttas, this and that, and teachers, all kinds of teachers, many, you know, many of them, there are so many who would like to be entertainers as well to gain more and more of a following. 
unfortunately, there is also the tendency that some teachers will overlook the need for the person, the student, to go and seek proper mental health. So this is crucial for that meditation teacher in this case, or religious guide, whatever you want to call it, to understand their role and then to also consider that there is a clear boundary between themselves, their role, and the role of a, a clinically trained individual to deal with issues of emotions, mental health, etc. Now, many students will not like this. They will not like this. And because that's tantamount to the teacher saying, you're crazy, in their mind. Remember the stigma part? We're very uh, quick in saying to someone, oh, go and see a therapist. But when it comes to themselves, hey, I'm okay, I'm doing meditation. Yeah, but every time you do an interview and the teacher says something that you don't like, you're about to take a baseball bat and hit him with it. Or the internal dialogue moves from, oh, I love this teacher, I love this teacher, I love you, teacher, I love you, teacher. Guess what happens after he says or doesn't say to you what you expected him to say? All of a sudden, there's resentment, hatred, and anger, what we call dosa. The three defilements, it's the second one. The first one means that is lust or greed. And the third one is delusion. So, all these are taking part in the mind. But when we're dealing with psych psychological disorders, mental health issues, usually they go far too deep in the person's character. Where not enough, uh, it won't be enough, that rather, to do a meditation treat or even expect a teacher to give you a meditation tool to get, quote-unquote, to get rid of those episodes. So what you end up is basically sometimes, in some cases, students going through you know, ups and downs. I've met even teachers of meditation, even teachers of meditation, with many, many students who go through those upheavals themselves. Even though when they sit, you know, sit in front of a you know, crowd, they, they put on this mask, as it were. It says, there's so much, you know, jovial mood and this and that. It's wonderful. But go and spend a day with them or half an hour. And you're like, whoa, this person needs help. So when the person needs help, let's refer them. Let's suggest at least to them that therapy is there to help them. Because in that case, therapy is not going to be working against you. In fact, it will lead you much smoothly into and onto your path towards Nibbana. Because you're just perpetuating the state of affairs that has led you to this situation in the first place. And you're procrastinating. So... Uh, otherwise, many, many people will take the easier, continue taking the easier route or the shortcut and go to meditation retreats, which can be a problem. Basically, the individual uh, would go to, let's say, mindfulness retreats and... Uh, Expect only good things to come out of it because people never stop talking about it these days. The one that I read about in this news article was about the 10-day retreats, uh, the silent 10-day retreats. Um, and um, without having the need to go into it, I think it, they're pretty familiar to most people uh, in the world today. So a person, I believe, from California had gone to the East Coast of the United States to do a 10-day retreat, and unbeknownst to the people on, on the retreat, the people who were running it, 
um, she had just signed up. She went, and I believe it was the first time that she's ever done something similar to that. And um, so she sits through 10 days, no talking, and uh, no looking at anyone. Um, and then once she fin finishes it, by the way, she, during the, the uh, from what I recall in the article, it said that she had gone a few times to the organizers and they were helpful at times and she felt good about it, but things were opening up in her. She was forced to face certain things about herself that were pretty intense. But because she was surrounded by a group of other people, usually they're in like 20s or 30 people or even more in some cases, and she was in a secluded environment with other people endeavoring, so she didn't perhaps feel that alone. So once the retreat is over, she flies back to California, I believe, and she now suddenly undergoes tremendous upheavals, emotional upheavals. So she is having major emotional breakdowns, and uh, she tries to reach back out to the organizers, but no one picks up the call. I don't know what was going on there. Uh, I believe she might have even emailed them, this and that, but all of those, no one was available to respond to her. Meanwhile, she's, her symptoms are getting worse and worse and worse until she actually commits suicide. She dies. I think she hangs herself or something. Now, this has been an issue because I've also done those 10-day retreats myself a few times. Uh, actually, yeah, not that many times. Uh, but I've done them. And I would see individuals who would come in without having had proper screening. Now I think they have added, some of these places have added on the application, hey, do you suffer from any mental psychotic breakdowns? Are you taking any mental, health, uh, mental psychiatric medications, etc.? Which is at least something to notify the organizers what to look forward to, in a sense, you know, at least to be prepared or uh, refer them out to uh, something less severe. So, um, this is a problem, because this individual uh, most probably came to uh, this center because everyone is doing it. That's what it looks like. Everyone today wants to do the 10-day retreats, so she also wants to put an end to her suffering. Because she's done this, and she's done that, she's on psychiatric meds, this and that. So this is a dangerous territory. A religious institution cannot afford to play both parts anymore. Those days of faith are long gone. They never fulfilled humanity's needs for mental health. Back in those days, they will not do it in the future, and def definitely they can't do it today. Yes, going and speaking with... Uh, uh, a religious person or like in the form of confessions, things like that, they can be helpful. Uh, but they're not giving you any particular cure or healing methodology because they're not trained. And if they are, they're very limited in their understanding. Unless the person has actual training. I, I won't say any, you know, I can't say anything about that because exceptions are there. Uh, but even that, there needs to be a separation between the roles, if anything, for the patient, for the person, the student, uh, to allow them to own up to what they need to do. The religion is not going to come and help the person. I have individuals who come to me and say, oh, Bhante, I do mantra, I do mudras, I do this, I do that, so I need... You know, I'm doing my work on the side, so how come I still have this? How come I still am dealing with this? Maybe they have an issue with sexuality, with certain issues growing up. Well, meditation is not going to give them all the cure that they need. 
not want, need. So sometimes the teacher is going to end up being uh, an enemy, even, in the, minds, uh, in the minds of these individuals. Because boundaries are being set, and they don't like boundaries. Because, hey, hey, come on, what, what, what is happening here? Because we were buddies, we were this, we were that. You were helping me. Yeah, but I was helping you in the capacity of a teacher. You need more serious help that I cannot provide. You need a specialist in that. Just like if a person has some esophageal disease or some, some cancer, you need to go and see an oncologist or internal uh, medicine doctor at the very least. You need to go and see a physician. You know, if your computer is having a problem, you take it to a specialist. You don't take it to church. You don't bring it to Bonte. Even if Bonte is trained in, let's say, in, in, in computer repair, that's not his role. So we need to respect the boundaries of what is to be expected from the church. Again, the church is just an example um, here for any religious uh, um, facility, center, etc., where uh, in, in, the, in the majority of the cases it's faith-based and, and, and uh, beliefs are there, etc. Again, this is not a criticism of, of anyone. Uh, it's just to help us delineate the proper roles of what uh, a, a religious teacher is supposed to be doing. We're not supposed to be doing both things, therapy and, uh, let's say, in my, in my case, uh, a meditation instruction or teaching of the Dhamma, the suttas. Let's face it, there are some people where meditation is not going to be helpful that much. Yes, I just did that, say that, as a Buddhist monk. You probably never heard this being spoken like this. But yes, meditation is not for anyone. Just anyone, that is. And what I mean by that is, there's other requirements that need to be uh, fulfilled. And remember what I said earlier about so many centers, Buddhist centers or, or meditation centers, that just talk about mindfulness, mind, even teachers who have tremendous, huge following around the world. They talk about mindfulness, but in the absence of sila, in the absence of morality and ethical structure, which is the backbone of mindfulness. Without that backbone, mindfulness is just, it's a joke. It's doomed to failure. Anyone who wants to omit the importance of sila or the virtuous behavior, absolutely essential part of the practice, and just pick up mindfulness is just ripping pe people off, basically, charging them money for certifications, this and that, and, and claiming that mindfulness is the best thing ever. No, it's not. You're actually setting up, setting them up for a worse and worse, uh, not just failure, but even worse situations, so long as the person is not being properly guided. And in some cases, the meditation, even sila is not going to be just on itself uh, enough. The person needs to get uh, psychiatric attention. They need proper work to be done by them, actually, uh, in addition to sometimes medical attention. So please don't expect the the therapy, uh, the <laughs> the Buddhist monk or the teacher to do that for you, to heal your emotional wounds. Sometimes they're of a su superficial or not as severe nature of a severe nature, which the teacher might be able to help, or the meditation practice can. But often, more often than not, old wounds are going to come out, and the teacher is not there, and the techniques that they have given you for the practice is very limited. What are you going to do with all this commotion, with all this eruption going on in your heart, in your body, in everywhere? 
you're going to have a worse breakdown now. Why? Because meditation was revealing certain things, which is necessary, but the therapist has to come in to do the other work for you. So please uh, don't stigmatize yourselves now. In the old days, it was the church. Now it's us, human beings, who look down upon mental health, even though it has so much to offer them. So for such individuals, as they do their own work for their mental well-being, their emotional well-being, working with a qualified individual, even in some cases with psychiatric medication help, under proper supervision by namely a psychiatrist and a therapist to work with them through the relational work, which is very important, Slowly, slowly, as the psychiatrist feels it, deems it necessary that, okay, we can wean them off, slowly, off the meds, in those cases, then the therapy becomes the primary thing in that regard, in the mental health. Meanwhile, they can actually conjointly work on their meditation throughout all, that, uh, all those phases, even when they're taking meds. But never looking at the meditation practice as the all in all. I feel compelled to talk about this because recently I found myself in a position where I had to delineate this a few times to people. And it is daunting, it's tiring, it's exhausting to do it over and over again. And I think it is only fair for individuals to understand why there needs to be a clear demarcation, a clear boundary between what needs to be addressed through psychotherapeutic interventions and what uh, the job, the role of a meditation teacher is. In this case, a Buddhist monk teaching a per the person uh, the Dhamma the Buddha's teachings and giving them meditation instruction. So these are crucial. They can work hand in hand. Absolutely, and that's why I'm talking about this. But they cannot be seen as one and the same thing. Of course, we're not in the presence of Lord Buddha who could do those two things. And he knew exactly the minds of the individuals and what was necessary for this person. He would know exactly what, how much dosage of a certain meditation technique, if you will, uh, this person would benefit tremendously from. Or sending them off to uh, a certain area. Or pulling them away from a certain area. Like he would never send somebody who was... Uh, not ready to go and live in seclusion, let's say, in the jungles. He would not approve of having this person go or sit out in the open next to a lake if the person, he saw the person not being ready for such an... He was just an amazing, amazing teacher. He never, ever did anything uh, that endangered a student's life. In fact, he did the opposite. He will always pull them back, in, including when students would, sometimes there's examples of this, a student was insisting uh, to go and meditate in a certain area. And Lord Buddha, his, his uh, uh, number of times that he would say the same thing is, is, uh, you know, is three. He wouldn't say it more than three times. And if the person still insisted on doing it after the third time, he was like the Buddha was just like, okay, washes his hands from that. And one particular example, uh, a monk says, oh, I feel so like this place looks so perfect for me, the mango grove, this and that. Oh, Bhante, let me go and meditate here. Lord Buddha says, no, no, come, come, come. Now is not the time. No, Bhante, it's perfect. Look at this. It's like the water, this... The lotus is this and that. It's perfect. I mean, come on. It's picture perfect. It's I'm going to attain arahantship here, this and that. And imagine, the person standing to him is Lord Buddha, the greatest teacher ever. And he is advising him not to. And he disobeys, 
after the third time. And the Buddha says, okay, you then do what you want to do. And he goes, and he has a horrific, terrible sit. He comes back frazzled, restless, anxious, nothing to do with the person that he was prior to leaving earlier. And he says, that was the hor most horrible sit I ever had, this and that. And Buddha smiles and says, didn't I tell you? So he knew the right conditions, the causes. And appropriately, he would uh, delegate. He would, uh, if you will, prescribe the right meditation. Of course, in those days, they didn't have a specific mental health practitioner. But we do now. In the Dark Ages, the Middle Ages, we didn't have those. But we do now. So let's use that today. Especially because there's so much, uh, you know, virtual meetings that people can do from anywhere in the world. So that's a great thing. So I hope this uh, talk helps in uh, helping people understand better the separation between what a religious practice denotes, means, and what therapy is supposed to do and help a person with. It is not supposed to compensate what mental health uh, practice uh, and adhering to uh, healthy interventions uh, would do to the person's well-being. They're both necessary. So I will stop here.